Welcome to Moonbase 2. everyone welcome back to moon base 2 we're doing another interview and today we're i'm we i who i'm i i don't know uh i am very excited to introduce you all to steve orlando the author of king grimlock and other comic books of bookiness hi steve hello how are you doing today just after Valentine's? i'm great i'm great i'm great we uh we well actually the fifth issue of king grimlock is is, is finally out so we're working on putting the trade paper back uh and uh you know uh collection to bed mm-hmm. and you know working on a shitload of other comics as you said uh because that's the way it goes but i'm excited this is the first time i've gotten a chance uh to talk on a podcast about transformer stuff I've done interviews and things but like uh it's my first transformers podcast so i'm pretty happy to be here no yeah, really happy to have you and you're on the right one because we're on camera but don't know if you can see it there that's my grimlock shelf at the top of my bed Right on. Um, so to say I was invested in this book without ever having read it um, is something for a surprise. I'll say it was a very nice surprise by the time I got to the end of it, but we'll get to that later on. Um, I always start this way. Who is Steve Orlando? Oh, man. Uh, I mean, Steve, probably the loudest and crassest uh, of, of my generation of comic book writers, uh, but also maybe the most obsessed, you know, I start, I, when I finally started making living off comics in 2015, I had, uh, I was about to turn 30. And at that point I had been on the ground hustling, trying to break into comics since I was 12. So that's what 29 and 12, 17 years. Mm. Um, so, I mean, I've had other jobs. I was a wine and food specialist before this. Uh, but this, I mean, from the time that I could, even before I could get my working papers, I was already trying to, to, to break into comics and learn the trade. So, um, I'm either the, my boyfriend would probably say I'm the most stubborn. Uh, I like saying the most driven, uh, <laughs> you know, on that. uh, but I do, um, I have a, my, uh, an intense mind for, for deep lore. Uh, and a, it's, it's, it's been a big reason why I love not just the comics medium, but but just exploring these these different uh, fictional worlds in general, and it goes for things like Transformers. But it goes, it, but it's also why I've become known as the deep cut guy at Marvel and the deep cut guy. Well, one of a few deep cut guys at Marvel and the deep cut guy at DC uh, mm. when I was there. Um, I've always I came to these to comics through collecting uh, because we didn't have a comic store in my town when I was growing up, so you know, before I'd ever read a DC comic or a Marvel comic, I had all the non-sport trading cards and all these things. And I had this just like, and I'd gone over them countless times. So mm. I had this just intense knowledge of who these characters were and really no question who mattered more than anyone else with the exception of like the big names everybody knows. Uh, and that goes for the for Transformers too, because I had not read the comics until I was older, like in my late well, whatever you call your pre you're my late preteens. Mm. Uh, but I sure had all the toys because I was getting them at the same flea markets and things that I was getting all of these non-sports cards and, and collector shows like that. My father sold baseball memorabilia. So I was always tagging along, but a secret uh, is that I don't really love baseball. So I was always <laughs> looking for something else to do. Mm. Uh, and if it's pop culture from the late eighties and early nineties, I probably have traded cards of it. Mm. Still waiting for someone to pick up the elf license. Uh, but when they do, I'll fucking be there. <laughs> I'm, I'm more worried that we are in a co- in a podcast where two people not only know what Alf is, but probably remember quite a bit of it. We were, um, God, we were watching, I was watching House of Gucci with my neighbor and my boyfriend over the weekend. And first of all, what a letdown. But regardless, <laughs> the most horrifying part for me is when the kids get a fucking Teddy Ruxpin, the most horrific gift of the 1980s. Oh, I swear yeah. that's the- like if the Chucky movies were about Teddy Ruxpin, I would not have been surprised. Like where if Teddy <laughs> Ruxpin was the basis for the Chucky movies, because all of those things are haunted. Yeah. Uh, to, I never had one, thank God, but I sure had friends with them uh, and they were they were truly horrific. Yeah, there was, uh, there was always so many things, toys or whatever. You just never want to be left alone with. Cause... No, not at all. I mean, that thing, it, you know, I, it was probably like sizing up my throat when I would sleep in. So... <laughs> 
Was it like moving around the room? You'd wake up in the middle of the night and just like, Teddy, you were over there. Well, that's what I imagine they would do, but that's why I wasn't a big sleepover kid, you know? <laughs> like only at the neighbor's, uh, you know, the neighbor that had a Sega Genesis, I thought it was better than Super NES, which is probably well, right. In, uh, yeah. probably, well, was I though? I guess, I don't know. It had Sonic, uh, it was better. <laughs> well, my take was that it had a better X-Men game because it had X-Men 2 Clone Wars oh, where yeah. you could play as Magneto. And it had a better Jurassic Park game. The top Yeah, the oh my God. The one where you could play as a Raptor. Uh, the amount of so, time I, I didn't own it, but I rented that game so much I broke the cartridge. Oh, for the days when you could even do that. Now I can't break it because you just buy it off like the Microsoft store and it's there yeah. forever. And it's also just not there. It's in the ether. It's in the cloud. Yes, they know. can take it away from you now. That's the scary thing. But um, right. So actually, just out of curiosity, what do you mean you were a wine and food specialist? That was my job uh, for 10 years out of college because I had a degree in Russian studies, uh, which is what my actual degree was in, but I didn't want to go to Russia and I, and I didn't want to work in the government. So like anyone else with a liberal arts degree, I took a job that I didn't need a degree for and started learning about wine, um, you know, mostly from productions in my hometown, but then I sort of escalated it, got out of where I grew up and moved to the Hudson Valley where I would work at a, I was working at a fancier store and I, you know, we would basically, I mean, like we would help people build collections. At least that's what I did. I mean, it was a retail store, so I wasn't hmm. a sommelier, but we did, you know, we had uh, clients who would just, you know, say that uh, they wanted a couple of cases of wine that they could put in the house and, you know, it would make it look like they knew what they were talking about basically. And so we were, we were, we were the backbone of folks who wanted to feel learned, look learned. Uh, and I was on the spirit side of that mostly. So that's what I did for uh, almost 10 years before comments. Hmm. Um, so that leads us into the actual book. And you've, you've answered this a little bit for me already, but, you know, we're going to, you know, we're going to talk about this in a little bit, but King Grimlock is tied into something super specific in Transformers to the point of obscurity. Um, what, you know, apart from, you know, like when you're a kid, you're picking up Transformer toys and everything else. Do you have much of a background with them in general? Or was it kind of like it just happy, you know, happy coincidence or what, what's the story? No, when I discovered the G1 show, I was deep in it. And I, hmm. I, I was, I, I, because of my age, uh, I, I caught what I now know were the G1 episodes basically up until the movie, which I love, the animated movie. Mm. But for some reason, I must have moved on, knowing me probably Ninja, to Ninja Turtles as a yep, kid. Same. And I never came back after the movie. So the fact that they were like whole seasons with Rodimus Prime and stuff, I now know and have watched mm. uh, as much as I could, you know. Uh, but I didn't know that when I was younger. And then by the time I, you know, there was that window where I was in other stuff. And then when I was back, it was all about Beast Wars and Beast Machines. And that was, we're now in the mid to late nineties. Mm. Um, but I, the, the, the first G1 seasons, and then to this day, I still love the 86 movie. I love that it's just low key, a serious war movie to the extent that mm. it was so shocking to audiences that they had to dial back the G.I. Joe movie. This is why Duke is just in a coma. Despite yeah, no, he's fine, he's fine, he's just sleeping. A, a clearly fatal injury <laughs> um but yeah no i mean i i mean i to, to this day i will get emotional if i hear like optimist prime say one will stand one sh or one shall stand one shall fall hmm. you know like um a very big deal for me uh and with that like most folks like there there are some there are some fandoms where my tastes run obscure but with transformers i'm the most vanilla you know <laughs> On planet. I'm an optimist guy and a grimlock guy and that's mm. one of the reasons that's how we got here and you'll note that they both appear in the series obviously. yes they do and they have some interesting characters stuff, actually despite the fact Optimus is barely in it but um well by by definition yeah we wanted to focus on grimlock but mm. I wasn't going to get into transformers without putting a couple words in Optimus's mouth good god uh I I think it's kind of like if you get the opportunity you just got it really don't you I, yeah, especially because I got to invert his freedom as the right of all sentient beings line, uh, hmm. you know, in the eyes of Grimlock. Um, but no, I mean, I, and, and I still show up for almost all, I mean, I, I will fully admit to folks, I, most comic creators don't have time to take in a lot of serialized media. So hmm. there are a lot of uh, like uh, animated shows that I've missed um, that I would love to catch up on, but there's just such a wealth of them, hmm. you know. Uh, I, good Lord, like it's, it's hard for me to find the time to get through an eight episode Marvel show, you know? So yeah, so, yeah. to say, 
Uh, and that said, I, I'm always there to give a shot to all of the movies, even if many of them are not that great. Um, you know, <laughs> although I will say, uh, genuinely, I it might have taken them six movies, but I genuinely love the Bumblebee movie. No, it's like it's a great film. Uh, I I think it's me, without the qualifier of Transformers, it's just good. And it gets it. You know, to me, that's where the first one should have been. And then that opening, it's just like it's like they made. You know, it really is just like the G1 world, and it's hmm. cooler than all of the Michael Bay movies, but. Um, you know, that said, I don't know if we would have gotten it without those other things we had to sit through, like exactly, the, you know, exactly. Listen, we, whatever I, he's called, I think like wrecking ball scrotum in the second movie. Oh, devastator. Uh, well, devastator. I'm doing it. I'm people can't see I'm doing the inverted commas thing. It's like devastator. Um, they change name in those films so many times. But anyway, so so we've got a bit of a we've got a, what sort of a, a foot in the fandom then. So where did this book come from? Because we're in an era where we have all standalones are tied into the main book for the most part. Um, we have crossovers, usually licensed crossovers or something like that, which are usually pretty interesting. But I can't think of the last time we got a book that was wholly standalone, completely non-tied to anything continuity wise and so unique. This is, I, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable saying this is the most unique Transformer story. Probably <laughs> in terms of like structure, Probably, I mean, since maybe Spotlight Cup, and that's a long time ago. So, oh, well, Cup, is great, though. Cup is great, though, too. I mean, he's mm. obviously not as much of a draw, but I think we all love Cup and his oh, yeah, his, his being his old war stories. Mm. Uh, but you know, uh, being how, the old man, oh, well, yeah, I, I always imagine as Abe Simpson, but um, so how did this book come about? Like, it's just so unusual. Well, I was talking to the folks at IDW and we knew that I, you know, I had interest in, in, in working in the world of Transformers because it was on my bucket list. And I had just uh, recently, relatively recently gone freelance. I was exclusive to DC for four years. Hmm. Um, and, you know, much like, I don't know if people who listen to this also are wrestling fans, uh, but like much like when Cody Rhodes left WWE and posted like a photo of everyone who wanted to wrestle, from the indies, I certainly had a list of things I wanted to do, uh, and Transformers was on that, so I was high near the top. So I, I talked to the the folks at IDW, and there was a couple options for uh, that they had for me. Um, but the one that was most interesting to me was exactly what you said. You know, pitches a couple standalone, uh, you know, blue sky type ideas, which is you know an industry term that just means like if you could do anything, what would you do? Like, don't mm. worry about suppositions or assumptions and things like that. And I felt good about that because I wasn't, you know, in all honesty, I wasn't really interested in, in working on something where I had to go back and read hundreds and hundreds of books and things like that. I mean, I'm, I'm, I say that as someone who literally did that uh, for the past year during the X-Men office, but at the time mm -hmm. I wasn't interested in it. Um, and I wanted to be able to just tell a wild story. Uh, that still featured characters I love. So I pitched the Grimlock, uh, I pitched Grimlock the Barbarian, which was like the log line at the mm. time. And then I also pitched like doing a, like a hard uh, mafia story featuring, oh, wow. if, if you said his name, I would, this was two years ago now, so I don't remember, but there was a Cybertronian gangster. It was like a cold based name. It was like Cold Snap or like Cryo Deck or- Cryotech. Someone, yeah, I was gonna say someone- Cryotech. There's only one guy with cryo in his name. <laughs> if it's uh, an, if it's if it's not something you came up with, but it's got it's not. It's, uh, yeah, so it'll be cryotech. Uh, so, and I was like, we could do uh, like a full-on hard barbarian book mm. with Grimlock, or like I want to do like a like violent crime story, like The Godfather, like The Rise mm -hmm. of Michael Corleone, but with but with Transformers. Uh, and they liked both, but responded more to, to Grimlock the Barbarian. And that's really where this, the story came from. They, they, they said, you know, we're, we have the main book, but then we want to do some other series that sort of take things in surprising directions. What would you do if you could do anything? And this was on that list, uh, hmm. especially because Grimlock, despite coming from Transformers does really fit. He is without any manipulation already a Conan type, you know, hmm. he's got a lot going on inside um, but isn't necessarily the most vocal person. Uh, you know, he speaks with his actions and a lot of, uh, and never mind that he's obsessed with being a king. It's a near compulsion mm. for him. So like, uh, it, the, the pieces were already there. You know, mm. it was the cleanest thing in the world. 
Uh, and that's how we came. That's how we came to do in the book. So I take it you're already like interested in a fan of um, the Conan Barbarian stories as well. Just going well, by like some of the books. I, I mean, well. like Transformers, there's been good ones and bad ones. But yeah, mm. no, I love uh, what, what, you know, the I, I, what I would generously call low fantasy. You know, if Lord mm. of the Rings is high fantasy, Conan, I'm happy to say, is it's frequently called sword and sorcery, not low fantasy. But I don't think there's anything wrong with calling it that. And, and I, know, I, I mean, just different genres. It, it's fantasy pulp, you know, and, and I do love that for sure. Conan's on my list too, but Jason Aaron is doing a great job there. So I'd never challenge him. <laughs> it's on my reading list actually, but um, so, okay. So what is it that put Grimlock the Barbarian apart, apart from it's this, you know, Conan-esque, very easy to fit into Conan vibe. It's like Grimlock in a, it, it's Grimlock's almost like a Conan character that's been dropped into a D&D game. So, yeah, I mean, so, oh, go on. Sorry. How did that evolve in your mind? Well, we had, I mean, it's still, he still had to learn something, right? He still had to be challenged. And, mm-hmm. and that was one of the big things of the book. You know, I'm very aware that there are multiple versions of Grimlock, uh, and they're often presented with varying degrees of intelligence and agency. So, you know, I did not want to write, I don't want to write quote it for lack of a better term, like stupid Grimlock. Mm. Um, but at the same time, the most the most ubiquitous versions of him have the Grimlock speech, you know? Mm-hmm. So my goal was to basically present someone, as I said, with an intent, like who is not in any way unintelligent uh, and combine, you know, the way that he verbally expresses himself is the way he expresses himself, but he's by no means dumb or, or like, or anything like that. There's an intense internal uh, thought process going on all the time. Mm. Uh, so I tried at least, to, in order to challenge this character, to have him have growth, you have to have a character that is, I think it's more like the original Marvel books. Uh, he speaks like yeah. pretty normal sentences. Um, and to me, that's what's always going on in his head. But when he talks, it comes out in Grimlock speak. Uh, and the good news is, is that I had just come off doing Curse of the Man thing, where that was also the vibe of She-Hulk. She-Hulk was speaking in Hulk talk, but was fully intelligent still, uh, like, like Jen Walters normally mm. is. So. That was the goal with him. And that's because we needed to have him, you know, I mean, how else do you have a character that realizes his mistakes and has like deeper contextual opinions about things? He had to have that. Uh, and so we had to send him to a world that that that, that challenged his, his core uh, characteristics, which you know, as, as we present here, it is about being the strongest. I mean, he's always been a person who really thinks that he should be leading, you know, because Optimus Prime is a wimp. And, you know, that compassion is compassion is for is for is for punks and all those things. Uh, and the goal was to show him uh, that that's not always the case uh, through actions. And, you know, that's where a character like Arco came about, because Arco is, you know, a toxic, uh, an exaggerated version of his own point of view at the beginning. Mm. But she doesn't have the context that he does. So she obviously takes it too far. And that scares him. It shows him that maybe he wasn't right all along, you know. Um, so she was created to be what, you know, folks, industry folks would call a dark mirror of Grimlock. She's not mm. a villain, uh, by any means, uh, but she is someone, uh, who through her actions makes Grimlock reflect upon himself. And that's what this story became, you know, like there is, a, he is a, an intensely strong character, but that doesn't mean there's not room for growth, uh, mm-hmm. and, and strength to diversify. And that's where we're going here. You know, he, you can't always just smash everything. But at the same time, he's a guy that is really excited. He got to punch a, you know, he got to kill a god. You know? Oh, yeah, like no, he, I, I he's, talk, talk he's about not, bucket he's list. He's, he's becoming more complicated in a good mm. way. Um, well, that's that's actually, like, something I was really interested about the book from, I think it was issue two when I really settled in on that. Like, we've had a lot of Grimlock stories over the years. We've had him as a hero, as a semi-villain. He's been on one side, he's been on the other. I would say... And so certainly in terms of this generation one Grimlock, this is the deepest character study of him we've had in 30 something years. And I'm not blowing smoke up anyone's backside or anything like that when I say that. That is, again, I have a shelf full of the guy. Believe me, I've read every single thing and seen every single thing he's been in. So wh- how do you, like, you, you broke some of it down there. But how do you view Grimlock as a character? Because I some of those lines, like the discussion he had about the Necrobot, I thought was a really interesting addition. And like, is there anything you added in there? <laughs> that you really liked? I'm only laughing because there is no greater Conan illusion than the discussion <laughs> about Necrobot. Yeah. I mean, it, it's just, I mean, for anyone who didn't pick up on it, it's, it's just the Grimlock version of when Conan is sitting, 
with uh, the thief. I can't remember his name in the in the in the John Milius movie, mm. and he's talking about Crom, mm. you know. Um, and yeah, I mean the I mean a that's one of my favorite pages because I'm really happy about sort of like giving a little bit of a look into like the belief system of Dinobots and things like that, but also applying it to applying it to transformer speak, which is very fun to me because I like details, but that, I mean, mm. in the same way, I, I, I thought that it fit. If Conan is going to be a transformer, pardon me, if Grimlock is going to be a transformer uh, reflection of a Conan type character, mm. then, you know, Krom is an unforgiving God. And that's a key because Conan's obsessed with toughness as well. And so with Necrobot, it's like, you know, we, we wanted to reflect that he, he has a belief system, but it's still one based around just being the hardest and all these mm-hmm. things. And it's just a little sad, right? Yeah, you know, like his, but that's shows where he's at at that time. In the same way that Conan is like, you know, like Krom doesn't. You know, I pray. I don't. I never pray to Krom because he's my god, but he doesn't care about us. And anyone who prays to him is weak. Mm. Like there's some real securitist logic there, uh, but it really speaks more about Conan. And in the same way, you know, if the greatest honor a Dinobot can have is just to, you know, kill as many people as possible uh, and die in a great way. Uh, to impress Necrobot, mm. uh, it you know that's the type of world building stuff that really appeals to me. That you know, in in Dinobot's eyes, when they die, they go before uh, they go before their digital god, and he tallies up how many people they killed. And the the greatest honor would be to have such a such a red ledger that you know his databanks can't even hold it. And, mm-hmm. and at the time, that's all Grimlock cares about. But as we know, by the end, he cares about it a little more. Mm. Uh, now, I I love the idea of it. I I I, I just thought that was just such a as you said, like very Conan in, in insertion into the story, um, which bring me to something else. I was, you know, the story itself is tied rigorously into Madman's Paradise, which for anyone listening to this who doesn't know, is a story where uh, season three Grimlock and Daniel go to a medieval world and there's a dragon who is also a wizard and there's a quintesson. And I was kind of shocked when I read this originally and it was just like, oh, hang on, wait, what? And it's just like, it wasn't just that it had the trappings of Mad Men's Paradise. It was almost like a sequel to a version of that story we never saw where Optimus was the one who went there. And like, why did you go with Mad Men's Paradise? What, what was the impetus behind that? Well, because with a lot of things when you're doing references to old lore, you know, I'm always happy for to do something that will reward longtime fans when you could when it could just be anything like mm. yeah, so, so the view on that with me and it goes for you know what I do in X Men too and what I do everywhere. If we could have created a new fantasy world, but you know what the world of Transformers already had one, so why wouldn't we use it? Mm. Uh, and at the same time, you know this has been 30 years. We don't necessarily know this is the exact same continuity as G1, so there's no reason we wanted to be shackled by it. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if we can do something that rewards longtime fans and is also welcoming to new ones, to me, that's having your cake and eat it too, and eating mm. it too, you know. Uh, and that's why we put the time jump in, uh, you know, where time moves differently, and and many people who were heroes are villains, and vice versa, you know. Now that they've returned. Mm. Um, but no, I mean, to me, the, 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 that's the thing, you know, could I have created something brand new? Sure, but could I, could I, could I reflect and, and build upon what's come before? Uh, again, in a way that if you're just picking up the book, you, you know something happened in the past, but you don't need to know any more than is presented there. But if you're familiar with that, then there's like a little extra seasoning. And, and, and that's the sweet spot I'm always going for. It's debatable uh, when it, it, if I always hit it, but that's always the goal, you know? Uh, because we do want to both welcome new new eyes on a book and reward the people that have been there for 10, 20, 30 years. Mm-hmm. Um, well, it was certainly a very enjoyable element of it, but um, sort of, you know. Also, like, I did ha- I did get mm. to make it, I can't even remember if the Woodbots can transform in the, like, in, in, in the original show, but, like. I don't remember, actually. You know, <laughs> I, I certainly try to get everything we could out of it, whether, you know, the wood bots, of course they turn into trees because they're wood. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I was very happy with their ambush there. Mm. Um, it's a little known fact that I already had the at least comic accurate transformation sign memorized because I put it in Wonder Woman when I was writing that book. Uh, when the invisible jet <laughs> transforms into the invisible starfighter, uh, you get the, uh, the, tra- the transformers noise. So That's fantastic. Um, <laughs> but... 
Yeah, no, there were just small things. And I like the Quintesson reveal too, but mm. we still, you know, we, we pumped it up. You know, I think that we made the Red Wizard much more powerful. There's certainly, I don't believe we're like undead zombies and things like that. No, no, that's not. Uh, and, but you know, we have to have things that Grimlock can fucking smash. Mm. Uh, also, while not becoming a mass murderer of humans. Yes. <laughs> to be that, but so, I also, I also liked um, to the, the way you, you know, you were talking about characterizing Grimlock and developing him a bit more. I also liked how, his constant response to this is one of kind of disgust of the dead being abused and the weak being abused and stuff like that, which um, is one element of his character that's always been there and it's just not explored a lot because most, a lot of stories just want him punching things. Um, so I was really glad to see that. Well, and that's his journey, right? Like when mm -hmm. he gets there, he, I mean, he's traditionally not incredibly sympathetic to humans, uh, not, not to the extent of someone like Optimus. Mm. But then when he gets there, you know, he can't sympathize with people who don't, I mean, that's the journey. He gets there, he doesn't care about what's going on with Valrift uh, because, you know, it's there's a degree of separation. Oh, well, something terrible is happening, but they're not like me. Mm. And then he sees the same thing happening to people that look like him, you know, mm. like he sees the woodbots. Whoa, suddenly this is bad, you know, like, and there's a way that he can relate to it. And that's his door in, which I think is something very real. It's something that happens in in, in the real world. It's easy to see something on the news or see something happen to folks that aren't just like you and write it off and, and sort of starve your compassion. But then, you know, as they always say, like eventually they come for you. And so mm. the, the wood bots are a turning point for him because yeah, suddenly he can't compartmentalize it. What's going on in Mononia is happening to things like him. And then once it has a face that he can understand, well, he's, you know, understandably pissed off about it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, it was, I really liked it. Um, Lead me back into another character, though, Arco. We mentioned her a little bit there. Um, you said she's Grimlock's dark mirror. And, you know, she starts off sort of, she kind of has what I call a, a sympathetic bell curve. She starts off sympathetic, she gets less sympathetic, and then she's sympathetic again at the end. How did you sort of view developing Arco in her character arc? Well, the, Arco, it was actually really simple. I wanted to have a spike for Grimlock. And obviously, because it's Grimlock and not Optimus or Bumblebee, you know, Grimlock's spike was going to be a dick. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's actually simpler than folks might think you know mm. like bumblebee is a nice guy and he's your best friend and then he has spike you know mm. uh and then he has daniel uh well rodimus has daniel i think right but um but you know the the spike for grimlock was never going to be like a gee whiz let's go fishing <laughs> like 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 oh but i would want to see that episode <laughs> like like I mean, it's that, like when you open the 86 movie, fucking uh, Daniel and, and Rodimus are literally are fishing and that would just yeah. never happen with Grimlock, you know? Like he would be like, you know, he would just like drop a fucking grenade in the water, all the <laughs> fish would come up and he'd be like fishing over, you know? So like, uh, so the goal was to give him a version of that. And of course it was going to be this stubborn, you know, angry kid um, because that's, you know, that's, that's a reflection of Grimlock. Um, but as well, it was to give him someone uh, who could take all the, basically at the art side, take all the wrong messages from his teaching because Grimlock, mm -hmm. and that is, as he soon learns, uh, it's not her fault, it's his, right? Because he does not know how to be a mentor or a teacher uh, at the beginning of the story. All he's used to doing is arguing uh, with other leaders and leading the Dinobots who are adults mm -hmm. and don't need to be told what to do really in, in the sense that, that a teenager would. So... I mean, she's there to basically listen to everything he says, but he doesn't realize what he's saying, um, really. And then when he sees it in action, he's like, oh, shit, I fucked up, mm. uh, you know, and, and he is not. But the key is he is not without compassion. Mm. Um, he especially by the end of the story, he probably thinks he's without it at the beginning, but he's not without honor. And pretty soon, because he leads her astray, uh, those two things become one of the same. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, no, that's that's interesting, especially when she starts really getting into the dark side and becomes possessed by an evil god and leading to a very, like, where'd you come up with the idea with the spark battle? I love that. I thought that was great. Well, it's, you know, a, a real hero has sacrifice, right? And mm. so we were we were trying to really, I mean, at the end, move, Co move him beyond that aspect of Conan. Um, and by the end of the story, he, I mean, he... Obviously, he thinks he can win the fight inside his spark, mm. but he is really making a hero's choice there. He's willing to put up his own existence for someone else's. And, and that's 
uh, I mean, in a story and, and character sense, that, that's the idea for, for tricking the golden one into his spark. And then in a practical sense, I wanted somewhere where he could go toe to toe, you know, with the golden one, because he probably couldn't have won outside. And so in that sense as well, he's evolving from his normal, like, Grimlock, I'm going to bash brains into doing something more like Optimus would do, which is mm. using real strategy and things like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a big moment for him because he has to admit what he can't do uh, by the end. He can't blot out the sun. Mm. Only the Minotian can do that. He, there are, he can be part of a team, which is something that he's always, at least in the, you know, in, 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 the, in the broad sort of iconic stuff that folks uh, point to, he, that he's often pushing, pushing back against that. Mm-hmm. No? Yeah, no. Uh, definitely. Um, so this is something I'm always curious about with um, creators come into the franchise, um, especially with IDW, especially in the last 10 or so years, we've been a, a place where people are leaving their mark on things. So what's, what are you most proud about with this series? Is there anything you've got to include that like, I've entered that into Transformers. That's fantastic. Like, is there anything like you'd look back on like big thumbs up? I mean, I can't believe we got through to the whole book, you know, like, mm. like, you know, even 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 though they the the license might be moving on, this book is always going to be there, um, and that's very exciting to me. Um, I mean, I think we tr- it's all it's all the most basic of of like blockbuster things that I'm proud of. We gave Grimlock a story where he could be in T Rex form fighting a fucking dragon in the yes. sky, you know, <laughs> and and I I I mean. God love other people that have worked for him, but he rips the face off a sun god at the end. So like, I'm very proud that we really gave him true moments of, of badassery that also he's earned, you know, there, there, that he has earned through growing as a character. But at the end of the day, he's still ripping the skin of, uh, the, <laughs> of, of Sultron's face off, uh, which is a very heavy metal moment. But yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I, those, those are the things that get me excited, you know, like mm. we got to take, we got to take Transformers and 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 deliver big fantasy imagery and iconography in a way that, that I think fits, you know. Mm-hmm. And and I focus on not necessarily these giant things. I you know yes, those two things I just said are big moments of violence. But again, like I said, I'm also proud of just little things like the ambush where the wood bots or the trees and things like that. Mm-hmm. You know, like I I I like to really fully explore the worlds we can. And you know we got away with Grimlock still being a hard, you know, a hard bastard when the when the situation called for it, um, but also really understanding the that the nature of strength uh, and, and honor is not as simple as he thought before. Which is, um, as as myself a stubborn bastard, like that that's that's very near and dear to my heart. No, or no, it's a really good thing to include. But on the same note, is there anything that hit the cutting room floor or an idea that came to you late that you just like? Oh, I wish I could have kept it. Uh, before the license left, I would tell you there was going to be a sequel. Uh, so that's oh, don't say that. Oh. Oh. Uh, we oh. were going to uh, we were going to Evil Dead the thing, and rather than Optimus pulling him back, he was going to go go through the portal at the end and end up somewhere uh, completely different uh, for the sequel. So he wouldn't eventually get home until like well, hypothetically, the end of the second or third. Oh, anyway, it. it was going to be called. I mean. I mean, I'll tell you because it's highly unlikely to happen. The sequel is going to be called Grimlock and Hell. Mm. And it was going to end with him beating the shit out of the Transformers devil, whoever we, we I, I would have had to research who that would probably be. Probably would have, probably would have ended it with him also having a face off with Necrobot. Um, oh. But sadly, sadly oh. that will not happen. This is going so well for me. I was in such a good mood. God well, maybe damn it. Like and um, I don't know. I mean, like, I would probably want it to be Necrobot, but I think in the actual lore, like, the devil is uh, the planet guy, right? Yeah, more Unicron. more Unicron. Which, to be fair, I mean, like, I, you, Grimlock killing Unicron in a fight would be fun, but... I mean, that would be a different book that I would happily <laughs> write, though, like like him eating his way out from inside Unicron. And oh, just wow. Being, like, oh, no, um, I like that. But I actually find the original like Transformers creation myth very fascinating, right? The mm. Unicron. I, I believe he's like, because his his counterpart Primus mm. is a, gives up his body to become Cybertron. Yeah, Denver, yeah. Right. So like, it's the two things: it's greed and selflessness, right? Mm. Like, so Unicron can't give up his own sense of self and importance, so he stays and becomes evil and and more and more evil. And Primus is the exact opposite. You know, he he is is giving literally of his own body, and and thus the birth of the 
the Autobot race, you know? Mm. So, but anyway, Grimlock and Hell, I do not believe is going to happen, but that's what got left on the cutting room floor. And I would have loved to see Grimlock. I mean, honestly, like it could only end with Grimlock, as I said, having a face off with Necrobot and then mm. beating him um, somehow and realizing that even his own God was a coward and he's mm. not. God damn it. <laughs> I hate industry. I hate industry so much. <laughs> uh, and I don't know, last time they did an in hell book, it was Godzilla in hell, and that was fantastic. Um, oh my God. Well, ours would have had more words, but yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, not many, but yeah, no. Um, very, very good. Yeah. That's but after, you, after you've bashed a sun god's brains, you know, like. You've done the you god go for the devil, you, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. You, you can only confront your own, your own god. Well, I was expecting you to say something like there was a scene of Grimlock giving someone a hug and I cut that. And now you just told me and ruined my day because I don't live in this timeline. I live in the wrong timeline. But <laughs> um, something I'm very curious now, you've had, a, you've had a taste, whether it was another go Grimlock or another story or your mafia story. If, if you got onto Vertigo and say, can I do the mu as much blood? Let's say we settle in a new licensee and everything else and... We, I mean, would you come back? Oh, for sure. Hasbro were great. Uh, they, I mean, they were really easy to work with. And uh, I, I would love to come back. I, I would. The only caveat is that it would be hard for me to go to something that was really continuity laden now because we've mm. already done it. There's nothing wrong with that, by the way. It just it would be hard for me personally because we've already been able to do this big bombastic story. Um, but that being said, you know, I, I love the characters. Um, I would, um, well, there are other IDW franchises that I would still like to do, but that doesn't really, it's not really germane to this podcast. No, no, no like um, I, no. I, I read IDW more than most of my but I would certainly, but I, but I would certainly come back, hmm. um, you know. Um, do you want to do a Godzilla book? Because I'd read that. I, <laughs> I have a pitch, I have a pitch in right now. We'll see if it happens. Good night, um, good night. But, um, no, I would love to come back. I would love to, I don't, I don't know what I, you know, like, I know they just did the new Beast Wars book. I do mm. love those characters, but I would, I would, I would want to do something again that could be pretty untouched. I would love to do a big like Silmarillion style book that is about Unicron and Primus because that's mm. the stuff. Clearly I love big lore, you know, like if you yes, I've Hunter, noticed. Hunter, I really, I, you know, we, Riley and I created a whole new culture for Mars's for, or DC's version of Mars. And mm. What's coming in Marauders in the, in the X-Men office is equally big, if not bigger. I mean, we're inventing 10,000 years of story um, in the first 10 issues. Mm. So right. <laughs> um, I would love, yeah, I mean, that's the answer, actually. I would love a really early, like, War in Heaven type thing that is retelling essentially Transformers Paradise Lost and you would end with, with Unicron and Primus. And that would be lit for me. I would do that in a second. Well, I am loving that idea. So please please keep up with us because I honestly think for a debut that for in the franchise, obviously not a debut, even writing for years, but a debut with this franchise, which can be a bit intimidating. I've, I've, I've spoken to a few creators over the years and especially if they haven't written Transformers before, I've gotten the impression it can be an intimidating one to dip into in part because of the size of the lore. Like I thought this was fantastic. I like, I thought it was oh, a great book. Like, the nice thing is, is that we got to dodge most of it by taking him somewhere we haven't gone in 30 years. But that's what uh, that's one of the things I honestly loved about it because I am very much in the mood these days for completely fresh takes and things. And the this kind of standalone book throwing a character I love into somewhere so out of his comfort zone, but still very him, um, was something I really loved. So if you wanted to do a lore book or any book at the moment, like you've got one sale anyway. But I mean, um, I would love, I would love to dig into the old, I mean, like, I would love, I don't know enough about it, but I would love to do like Optimus's bloodline of the primes and things like that too. Like I'm, mm. I know the shit movie version, uh, but I'm way out of date to like the overall, well, at least some of the predominant canon versions. Cause I know, mm -hmm. I know there's probably a variety of canons. Um, but I mean, I, and I would like to do more with Optimus somehow I do. I mean, I didn't get to use him a lot. And because I was such a follower of, of the G1 stuff, especially, you know, like he's basically like Captain America or Superman to me, mm. you know, like I, I, I really enjoy, I mean, his nobility almost even to a fault, um, you know, uh, and, and I, would I would love to do more. And you could do a Grimlock style book with Optimus too, because I mean, the Optimus, the Optimus book would have to be different 
but to be clear, you know, like he is a freedom fighter for everybody, even if you're not a transformer. So you can mm. drop Optimus into, I mean, you can drop Optimus into a world that's like Apocalypse in DC Comics and he would still be fighting to liberate everyone. Mm. Uh, you know, freedom is the right of all sentient beings does not only pertain to humans and transformers. So uh, I think there are a lot of avenues there that could be really fun and surprising. Like there's a lot of things that people would expect, but the thing with these any of these franchises that uh, have this many years on them Mm. is to surprise people. Uh, I mean, I say that as someone who's working for companies celebrating their 80th anniversary, right? Like, <laughs> you gotta uh, it's part of the job. Uh, mm. But that's also when you throw pl- people in unexpected places, as you noted with this book, that's when you can really see uh, their character come out, right? Because they can't relax, they have to react. Uh, and I think as a creator, that's really interesting to me. Mm. Well, um, I think we've come to a very nice place to wrap up because I think that's a lovely sentiment. and. Um, before we go anywhere, is there anything you're working, like you said Marauders, is there anything else you're working on or anything you want to plug or any social media or anything like that? Uh, well, I mean, on social media, I'm very easy to find. I'm at the Steve Orlando on Twitter and on Instagram and my Facebook. I don't really do professional stuff on that's more for me and my old life. So look to Instagram and Twitter and I'm very accessible. Mm-hmm. Um, and look, I have a lot, I have a variety of things coming out soon, but, uh, Right now, uh, the most exciting work I'm doing is definitely in the X-Men office. It's my main push. And it's been one of the best creative experiences I've had since going freelance. To be clear, like readers shouldn't be buying something because I'm having a good time. However, (laughs) when I'm having a good time, that means the books are also the best they can possibly be. So you're gonna be getting massive, massive swings in the world of Krakoa and X-Men coming from Marauders, which by the way, is just one of a variety of books in Destiny of X that are all just doing huge, storytelling uh everyone in this office is operating at the top of their game i have my uh own proclivities uh, i'm very excited for knights of x by teeny howard yes very i was excited. going to say i'm very curious about the one with psylocke on the dragon <laughs> uh, uh uh my friend captain britain psylocke <laughs> is in my book oh i thought that was um was that, what was i reading that said it was psylocke i read something that said it was psylocke <laughs> Well, I understand your confusion because the world was confused. No, uh, so Betsy Braddock is now Captain Britain. Psylocke, oh. the, Psylocke is the Japanese woman again. In oh, the actual okay, okay. Mind in the body because Chris Claremont just loves, for some reason, race swapping people. <laughs> no idea why. But now, now Quanon is actually back in her real body, and she is Psylocke in my book. And Betsy is back in her English body, and she's Captain Britain. Captain Britain. Okay. Cool. Uh, but and Kylan also from the old Excalibur run is in Knights of X, and I oh. love that character. Cool. So um, very excited for that. Kieran on Immortal X Men and Al on uh, X Men Red are going to be great. Leah Williams has a new book coming out, but I'm certainly not going to spoil on this podcast or any podcast. But it's a perfect fit for her. There's just great stuff coming out. But for me personally, um, you want to talk about intimidating. Uh, the X the, the X Men lore and the X Men line is the best it's been in probably probably uh, well a long time. I'm not mm. going to shade other people, uh, and to be part of it is super exciting. And we're going to give you some wild wild shit that I can't <laughs> believe I got away with. But we pitched it to Jonathan, <laughs> we pitched it to Hickman, and he was like, "No, you should actually make it even bigger." And I was like, "Okay, John." Uh, so that hits in March. The annual is out now. Please check it out. And don't forget, by the way, that you can pre-order the King Grimlock Collected Edition right yep. now. I was going to say, make guys, make sure you get your pre-orders in for King Grimlock. It is well worth your money, if only for the D and D um, character profiles at the end, um, <laughs> which I love. By the way, I love those so much, and I'm I'm very new to like D and D as a game, but. I love, I got such a giggle when I saw that the first time. Well, you can, I, I will give full credit to David Marriott from, uh, from IDW uh, mm. for that. We, we, that was his idea and it was a great idea. So we're, mm. we're really glad you enjoyed it. Uh, well, guys, um, if you want to check out Steve's stuff, check him out on Twitter. Steve, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this. Yeah, my pleasure, my friend. Yeah. Um, yeah. Check Steve out on Twitter. Uh, guys, if you want to send us any comments or any follow-up things, you know, the email address moonbase2 at gmail.com. And if you're on Patreon, you can throw us a couple of dollars and you'll get shows like this a week early and you'll get access to our Patreon exclusive shows as well. You know this by now. Um, yeah. Steve, thank you so much. And I will let you get on with your day. It's my pleasure, man. I would, uh, hopefully I can do more robot stuff and I can be yeah. back. Well, I will have you back anytime, sir. <laughs> Take care. No, right now. We'll see you guys. Bye-bye. You are now leaving Moonbase 2.